सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली एज यू वुड एक्सपेक्ट साइजेबल कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी इज ब्रोकन आउट अबाउट मोदी गवर्नमेंट परचेज और प्लान परचेज ऑफ थर्टी वन एम क्यू नाइन बी रोन from america from the company called general atomics in america now controversies why did i say as you would expect that is because this is the bofors legacy any time post bofors any time there's a there is a weapon system purchase from overseas there will be talk of a scam in the late 80s there was the bofors there was a type 209 submarine purchase from germany so effectively anything you bought from the soviet union was kosher fine because it was government to government in any case nobody quite knew what price was being paid what was barter what was rupee ruble trade how many shoe uppers or how many how many bags of basmati rice or ship loads of basmati rice were being supplied or being given exported to soviet union in exchange of maybe one make all those things we didn't know those things were non transparent but any time there is a there is the purchase of a western weapon system there is a scam talk of a scam and a controversy so the congress party has now raised many questions about the modi government's mq 9b reaper drone purchase now what the price is what the price should be these are these are things on which not enough detail is available right now so either you can do the political thing and take one side or the other right and say oh so and so is a usual suspect or so and so as expected cannot be corrupt so we are not going there that is not what matters to us as far as the subject of today's episode of katak today is concerned today we are looking at what these drones are what are they capable of doing are they needed if they are bought eventually if they come into service with the indian army navy air force what will they do what have they done so far which countries are using it what are the capabilities how are these different from the earliest avatars of these drones that's what we are talking about controversies whether scam or not those things will unfold in the course of time now 31 drones are being bought 31 drones and ministry of defense in india said that the value is about 3 billion dollars so we don't know 3 billion dollars exactly how much it is what sensors what radars what sonar stuff will be put on these drones what will they do because all that will all that will be allocated out of the same budget so we don't know how that 3 billion if it's 3 billion dollars how does that break up again besides the value of the drones there is also the value of the ground station because an aircraft has its pilots on the plane but even then there are people on the ground people on the ground who are guiding the pilots people on the ground who are getting the data from the pilots in this case the pilots and all the others pilots analysts people who man, man the sensors are all on the ground in fact to keep an mq9b drone running for 24 hours or 24 by 7 these drones can do up to 40 hours in one orbit 40 hours right usually if it's carrying any payload it might do less if it's it has a weapon load it might do it can carry more than 2100 100 kilos of weapons although we don't have much evidence at this point that india is buying armed drones the armed version although donald trump administration had cleared the sale of armed of the armed version to india in 2019 but you can convert one to the other i would presume so so if it's an armed version it has nine hard points that is four on each wing these are large 24 meter wingspan four on each wing and one in the middle on the center line so it can carry nine nine weapons nine missiles nine bombs nine weapons tot a total weight of 2155 kg so if it's carrying all that weight it will be it will have lesser endurance maybe 24 hours but it looks like indian forces are planning to use these mainly for what is called as isr isr is intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance and also anti anti submarine warfare and marine domain awareness right because the expanse of the seas the ocean is very vast 
you can never have enough vessels going out there to track so much but if you have assets in the sky particularly assets in the sky that can be there for a very long time and and do not require pilots because even if you would put aircraft up there that can fly 40 hours what will happen to the pilots they'll have to be shifts of pilots etc so indian navy has p8i's for maritime surveillance but those are large aircraft have a large complement of crews these ones can do the same job with no crews at least in the air for 40 hours running up to 40 hours running to understand how useful they've been look at the utilization that the indian navy has carried out of the two mq9b's that were uh, sea guardian version the sea version that were leased to them in 2020 in 2020 india amended its defense acquisition procedures whereby it could also acquire weapon systems on lease although by the way i'm a little bit doubtful on this little bit because in my mind a question arises that if this only happened in 2020 then on what basis were we leasing the nuclear submarines ssns nuclear not nu nuclear weapon carrying but nuclear powered submarines from the Russians or the Soviet Union before that. The Charlie class first and Akula class later. So we, we lease those two submarines. In fact, the third lease submarine is right now awaiting delivery because India and Russia have finalized that deal some time back. I don't know what will happen now after the war, but the fact is that we were leasing weapon systems earlier also. I don't know what the dispensation for that was unless India, Soviet, India, Russia, were, for, were all done according to different rules. Nevertheless, 2020, Modi government amended the def defense acquisition procedure after which Indian Navy acquired two of these Sea Guardian drones on lease. Now, these drones were of much lesser capability than the drones that will come in now. Because remember, the first of the MQ-9 category drones flew in 2001 so these are 2022 20, years old they've evolved again and again and again the first of the the first of the original avatar that is the predator now you might have found sometimes the word description reaper used for these drones and sometimes predator so to call them predator is a bit of a misnomer because predator was the parent of this drone predator flew first in 1994 and predator was a much lighter drone in fact if anything the engine power of this mq9b reaper is 15 times more than that of a predator i'll give you the details in just a couple of minutes the predator was a 1994 weapon system it was a piston engine system this one is a turboprop system much bigger but for ease of description it is sometimes also called a predator b right so reaper or predator b is now what's coming in so, so the two mq9 sky guardians the earlier version that the navy has been flying on lease since 2020 together the two of them have already done 10,000 flying hours and the Navy lays great store by them. 10,000 flying hours. In, fa in fact, if you want to see comparisons of the Navy's mainstay for anti-submarine warfare of maritime domain awareness, MDA as it's called, that is the P-8I fleet. P-8I fleet is now 12 aircraft, but the first came in 2013, 10 years back. The last came in February last year, right? So this delivery took place for almost across across almost an entire decade in that entire decade these aircraft in that entire decade these aircraft have done 40000 flying hours so 40000 flying hours for 12 aircraft over 10 years these two drones have done 10000 flying hours over 2 years so that is the kind of utility these have. Now, the one little confusing thing here is that if India is only buying 31 of these, why are these being divided up? I can understand 15 being given to the Navy because predominantly the Navy always has been the biggest customer and the biggest enthusiast of these drones, mainly to keep an eye on the vast expanse of the seas because there is a great deal of load and burden on India's maritime aircraft, which also then keep a lot of the pilots in the air for a long time. And these aircraft have been busy, busy, busy. So the Navy wanted these Sea Guardians. So 15 of these are going to the Navy, I can understand. The remaining 16 are going 8 and 8 to the Army and the Air Force. That to me sounds like the old Indian habit of dividing up 
our assets into penny pockets, right? We bought Apache aircraft. So the first 22, the Air Force got, then the army said, we also want some. So for the army also, six are on order. Army will have these six. So what's the point if you're going only going to have 28 helicopters, attack helicopters of the Apache category? They're the best of the best, the most potent, which carry the most payload, most long distance missiles, sensors, etc., etc. Why don't you have them together? Why do you divide them up in penny pockets? But those are the issues of interagency coordination and the lack of what is called as joint manship in the armed forces, if I may call it, if I may call it so. And these are questions that tomorrow's theater commands, if they ever come into being, there's a lot of resistance. If they come into being, these are the questions they are supposed to address. 22 of these Apaches, Indian Air Force has, Another six the army will get. Now, how will they work? The army says they will stay with the army's strike corps. So once again, six here, 22 there. Similarly, in this case, the drones, very expensive equipment, 15 with the Navy, that you can understand, but eight with the army, eight with the Air Force. They will be debating questions about whether that is the wisest policy, because once again, a limited, a limited, a very valuable, very exp expensive resource, available in small numbers, you are dividing in penny pockets. So each one will have their own infrastructure, their own trained personnel. Again, there'll be issues about sharing of facilities or duplicating facilities. That That is an ongoing challenge with the Indian Armed Forces and that is being reflected in this purchase as well. In fact, does it really matter who's operating these weapon systems? Now the Navy has had these two Sea Guardians and if they've done 10,000 kilometers of flying already, it's not as if they've done all that flying over the seas. They've done a lot of flying along the frontiers with China and Pakistan. They've done a lot of flying in Ladakh. They've done a lot of flying along the LOC, tracking what's happening across the LOC and LAC. And they've proven invaluable because they have sensing equipment. They have the most advanced sensor. So how does it matter whether you keep it with one or the other? But in the Indian system, the government somehow always ends up distributing this between the three forces, like a parent who comes home with a bunch of goodies from foreign travel, distributes them to all their children. It's a bit like that. A bit difficult for me to understand. Now, which are the countries that are already using this? America, obviously. America has 300 plus of these and they've used these in many places. Not just Iran, Afghanistan, but in Libya, in Syria, in many places, they've also lost many. So it's not as if these are, these are infallible. They can be brought down. Americans have lost about 38 of these overall. These have been shot down by Libyans using Russian made Panzer missiles, because these are very large systems and very slow moving. Even the latest version with the new engine with higher power, 15 times more power than the original Predators. That also has a maximum speed of 480 kilometers per hour. And these are not very maneuverable. After all, they, they have only one turboprop engine. So these are very large. They have no stealth features. They have insufficient autonomy. They have to be controlled from the ground and they can be shot down if they are being used in a combat role. And that's why the limitations that the Indian armed forces will have in this case. And that is, that is what has drawn criticism from military experts. I'm not talking about political critics or political adversaries of the Modi government, but military experts that look, you have these very slow moving, very large, very valuable and very expensive drones. All right. You don't have pilots on them. So you don't have to worry about losing lives. But at the same time, if you have to use them over Pakistan or China, you simply do not have the availability of uncontested air spaces. Because in any air space that is cont contested, either from the air, both China and Pakistan have good radar systems. They'll pick out your movement, particularly a large aircraft like this, a large object like this. They'll send their fighters after you. And they have a lot of defense. Their air defense ground system is bristling with surface to air missiles. So what will be the, the chance of survival of a drone going into that territory? So that is a criticism. And that might be the explanation why the Indian armed forces are not yet putting too much money into buying the armed version of these drones. It's only the Navy likely which might 
by the armed version because they want these drones to be used for submarine hunting. Now, submarine hunting, these drones have a very good capability and that is something that's proven. And I'm not just looking at the advertising because this is something that Indian Navy's own experience tells us. How Indian Navy has used it, the Navy Chief Admiral Hari Kumar explained this today on camera. So as I speak, you will see that video also running on the side where he's explaining to us how these, how these work. And I'm sharing also with you a link of that video, which is on our website. So you can, you can go and watch that, watch that video. If I go to the website of General Atomics making claims about these drones, they say this drone has the ability to identify a vessel of interest, vessel of interest, and, and I quote from the website, and preserve custody of that target for hours, which is right? Uh, like that. I'm sorry to make it a bit facetious, but it's like the drone identifies a target, says this is a target of interest. It may be a submarine deep down, but then keeps it sort of located there until other assets or other weapons can get there or unless it is wartime or it is a hostile environment and the drone itself is carrying weapons. So it it's going to be the most useful for the Navy. And once again, you can buy it for one service, but you can use it for any other. So while the bulk of what the Indian Armed Forces are buying is for ISR, that is intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and also marine domain awareness and and searching for submarines, submarines, other hostile vessels or vessels of interest, which can be narcotics carrying vessels. In fact, in fact, the Americans have given a couple of these drones to Dominican Republic. Why does Dominican Republic need these drones and how can they pay for these drones? So those drones are being run by them under American supervision purely for catching narcotic smuggling. So it has many of those functions as well. Now, ISR is the main function, but the Navy also might go in for or might keep the ability or keep the provision of converting these, these into hunter killer drones. That means drones that can hunt for a target, mostly, mo mostly a submarine because it will be quite risky to get these drones to get too close to a ship that carries its own surface to air missiles, but submarines, right? There, for that, you could then equip these with weapons or so these could become hunter killer. These could become the hunter killer version of the same drones. I told you earlier that I will tell you some little technical details of the difference between the earliest version that is the initial predator and what we have now, which is, which is Reaper, but also called Predator B. And I told you that Predator B's or Reaper's engine power was 15 times that of the earlier Predator, the original Predator. Original Predator had a piston engine of 115 horsepower, 115 horsepower, shaft horsepower. I don't ask me exactly what does that mean. I can only give you relative figures. The new one, the Reaper has 950 shaft horsepower with a turboprop engine. And to that extent, a lot more weapon carrying ability. Which are the countries operating it? I told you the odd example of Dominican Republic. But besides the US, which has 300 plus US Air Force, then there is NASA, then there is the US Homeland Security Department, and then a lot of the NATO allies. There is Belgium, France, UK, Germany, Greece, Italy, Spain, then other American treaty bound allies, Japan, Canada, Australia, by the way, was buying some and then canceled the order. And then I find a surprising entry there. I find, for example, Morocco. So in which category does Morocco fall? So Morocco is a major non-NATO ally, but some of this was given to Morocco. Morocco and the US came very close when the fighting was going on in Western Sahara with the Polisario front issue. Maybe I'll talk about that in another episode at some other point of time. But also in 2020, when there was big excitement over Abraham Accords and many Arab countries were normalizing their relations with Israel and they were being incentivized by the US as Morocco normalized its relations with Israel. The delivery of MQ-9Bs was promised as a sweetener by the Americans to the Moroccans. So they are there as well. 
And finally, finally, the operations. You've seen the movies. You've seen these. You've seen these guys go and kill all these terrorists in Afghanistan, Syria, here and there. But what happens when one of these loses its way? I read the story about one drone which, in 2009, lost contact with its base. Now, each drone is then managed by a very large base. Very large base. In fact, to keep a drone drone running for 24 hours, that is 24 by 7, you need anything between 8 to 12 pilots, right? You will also have to have them if this, this was a, a manned aircraft flying like that because people will have, take, will have to take turns. So it takes 8 to 12 pilots and then again a group of analysts, intelligence, electronics, sensor analysts running into scores of people. So each one has to have a large control station on the ground. Now this drone in 2009, in fact 13 September 2009, lost lots, lost contact with its base and it looked like it had lost its way and was flying towards the Tajikistan border from Afghanistan. Now that could have caused an incident because Tajik Air Force would then think that they have a hostile, they have a hostile aircraft coming into their territory. So what did the Americans do? They actually directed an F-15 Eagle towards the drone. F-15 Eagle found the drone and fired a missile at it. That missile destroyed the drone's engine. It was still floating. Before it could crash, the ground was able to re-establish control with the drone and then it was directed towards a mountain site to crash there harmlessly. That was to avoid the drone crashing into any populated area. So Problems can also arise with with these drones. They are not infallible. Now, how does this drone war warfare work? Particularly large drones of such long endurance. These are called hails, high altitude, long endurance, right? So the best the best description comes in this book by Mark Mazzetti, who's a New York Times journalist. He covers intelligence agencies, the CIA, for the New York Times. In Washington, this book is titled The Way of the Knife. It's one of my favorite books. And towards the end of the book, after he's talked about all these operations, he takes you back, he takes you into the air base in near Las Vegas, in Nevada Desert, where the control control center for these drone operations is located. So he, he takes you to the little town, the sleepy town of India Spring. And close by, close to that town is the Creech Air Force Base. C R E C H. So I will just read a para from the book for you in conclusion to give you an idea of how these things work. Mark Mazzetti writes, both the Pentagon and the CIA fly drone missions out of Creech and military personnel and civilian contractors involved in the drone program still commute to the base from Las Vegas suburbs, pulling shifts in long sand colored trailers lined up into neat rows. Sometimes they fly training missions at Creech, navigating the predators and reapers near the base, honing their deadly skills by tracking civilian cars and trucks driving along the lonely roads on the highways. But mostly the pilots are fighting a war thousands of miles away in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Yemen and across the great desert expanse of North Africa. In the weeks after the September 2012 attack on the American diplomatic compound in Libya, the skies above Benghazi, filled with the buzzing sound of American drones, sent there to track down the perpetrators of the attack. At the edge of the Nevada base, washed out red cement barriers carry a proud message. Creech Air Force Base, home of the hunters. And if you want to read more about it, Check out this book. This is not a new book. This is a 2013 publication. So a lot more has happened and a lot more development has taken place with the doctrines and with the technology of these drones since then.